Welcome to Building Sustainability Podcast with me, your host, Jeffrey Hart, aka Jeffrey the Natural Builder. Every fortnight, join me as I talk to designers, builders, makers, dreamers, and doers, exploring the wide world of sustainability in the built environment by talking to wonderful people who are doing excellent things. Hello, and welcome to episode 75. Ez is back to talk more building science. And on this episode, we're mostly focused on his deep retrofit project, which is his own home. His house is being retrofit to the passive house retrofit standard, which is called Enerfit. Uh, but within this talk, we also talk about ventilation and air tightness, with Ez giving real world examples of what naturally ventilated homes actually look like. Uh, and we end up by talking about passive house swimming pools. So... It's a little bit of a mixed bag. Before we get into the episode, there's just time to say thank you to our new Building Sustainability Heroes. The new patrons supporting the podcast are Jacob Felton, Dave, no surname, just Dave, uh, Alex Carroll, who uh, I will be carving a spoon for Alex because they have gone for the £5 tier. Thank you, Alex. Uh, And a big shout out to Ross Langley, who has just upped his monthly support. Thanks to all the new heroes, the upgraded heroes, and to all the existing heroes. It really does make a huge, huge difference for your support. Okay, on with the episode. My house, I'm insulating my house with, well, yeah, I'm using wood fibre board, for example. Um, Uh Uh-huh. And why did you choose wood fiber? Because what I'm doing, so I'm, so it's a, it's a, it's a hundred mil deep uh, timber stud frame. Yep. And when I stripped the plasterboard off, um, there was like 10 mil of uh, glass fiber. Right. Insulation, <laughs> uh, glass wool insulation. Yeah. Uh, or was it glass wool or mineral wool? I'm, n- I'm never sure about which is which, but there's the pink stuff. I think it's glass wool. I think that's glass. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like 10 mil of it. Um, and well, it's supposed to be pink quite often. It was black in my case, cause it was moldy, mm-hmm. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so, that. so, uh, and, and remarkably like they, you know, they, the people who put it in had done a really good job. It was installed really well. There was just mm-hmm. only 10 mil of it. Like, <laughs> so, I mean, well, I don't really understand. Can you even get 10 mil of insulation? It might've been 15 mil. I'm not sure, but it wasn't very <laughs> thick. <laughs> It's hard to measure how thick, you know, that that little mineral is. Anyway, so so what I'm doing is I'm replacing the mineral wool. I'm taking the mineral wool out. Yeah. Um, I'm replacing it with 100 mil bats of um, hemp and jute insulation, mm-hmm. and then I am um, putting an, an there's a racking board on the outside that you can see. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's that's already there. I'm adding another racking board on the inside because I'm adding studs to the windows because there are the structural engineer was not happy about the windows right you can see that there's a, a historic window opening there that you can see and we're going to reinstate a window there mm-hmm. um and there's no lintel which is apparently a bad thing right <laughs> the structural engineer got very very excited about that <laughs> there's no, no lintel um, and there's only one stud to each side of the window yeah um and there should be you know two or three um, there and then mm-hmm. also above that chair that you can see uh, can you see there's two full height studs and then two half height studs and so that was where there was a, a wood stove flue had been added um, right. to the house and they just chopped the studs and um, <laughs> and <laughs> stuck a flue through the wall great so i've i've added two full full height studs there so yeah so the 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 i'm adding an extra sheathing board an extra racking board because those new studs that I'm adding have to be tied together. Yeah. Have to be given um, lateral support. Mm-hmm. So I'm adding a, a vapor open racking board there. And then I'm adding 40 mil of wood fiber board. The rigid stuff. Rigid wood fiber board. Like yeah. Tongue so and groove think, type. Uh, tongue and groove. Yeah. I think it's multi therm or ultra therm. I can never remember which stuff, the mm-hmm. Gutex stuff. Yeah. Um, one of them's got tongues and grooves and one of them doesn't. I'm using the one with tongues and grooves. Um, and principally the reason i'm using that there is because that's the easiest thing to fit onto what i'm doing 
Yeah. And the tongues and grooves is good because it's easy to get gap free insulation. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, and then I'm putting a vapor barrier in. Um, and then I'm having a service cavity. Yep. That will have a bit more insulation in it. Uh, and the vapor barrier is going to be Intello. So, um, that's, uh, able to, it, you know, principally most of the time the vapor pressure is from the inside to the outside. So it's yeah. stopping vapor getting in from the warm, humid room into the wall. But in some summer conditions, the vapor pressure can be reversed. Mm-hmm. And in those conditions, the, the Intello can open up and let moisture back into the room to, so it can dry in both directions, basically. Mm-hmm. And the reason I wouldn't necessarily have used that on a new build wall because I would have been more in control about what the vapor permeability of the outside surface was. Right. But here I've got ply and and I didn't put it there and I can't do anything about it. And I'm not sure how vapor permeable it is. So I want the wall to be able to dry out in both directions, yeah. basically. So uh, why am I using wood fiber board there? Like the fact that it's thermally massive and will help with overheating is nice, but that mm-hmm. wasn't part of the consideration really. Although it, I'll probably be using it on the roof and it will be the part of the consideration there because yeah. um, that we get much more direct sun on the roof and it's black. Uh, basically, yeah, you can, you can fix it to the studs and, mm. and it's, 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 it works from that point of view. Um, yes. So you're cover, covering all your, your thermal bridges with the, with the board. Yeah. And it's, it's really interesting doing this benefit project you know, there's it's such a huge question, like how deep should you go on retrofits? Mm-hmm. And going back to what I was saying before about how uh, it, it, one of the things I learned at the Earthship was that people who've invested lots of time can't be trusted to be unbiased. <laughs> so I'm yeah. in that situation now. Yeah, I'm, I'm investing like absolutely enormous amounts of my time into doing this benefit and trying to remain objective in what I think of it. And, and it uh-huh. could go either way. You know, I could flip to saying, geez, I've spent so much time on this. Deep retrofit is definitely not the way forward. It's just way too hard. You, I could easily see how someone could get to that point from what mm-hmm. I've done so far. Or I could be like really defensive because I've put so much emotional you know, worth mm-hmm. into it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really interesting with my house because so, so on, the, on the walls there, where, where the studs meet at the corners, I think they're just meeting like there's there's one stud in in one wall and one stud in the other wall and there's a gap behind it and it might have 15 mil of insulation in it right but it might not have anything at all and even if Mm -hmm. it has 15 mil of insulation you know it's basically nothing um so if i wasn't adding the 40 mil of wood fiber board inside of that at each corner i would have a a bit where there was no insulation at all essentially so to not do that to not add that insulation it, it would you'd probably end up with mold in that corner, I think. Mm. Um, it would certainly maybe be you could, a weak spot, wouldn't it? Yeah. And maybe you could get away with it if you're insulating the, the service cavity. Maybe that would be okay. But but I keep coming back to this idea of like, okay, well, what I'm doing is really radical. And part of the reason I'm doing it is because I'm interested in these things. I'm interested in like, how good can you make a crap building? Mm-hmm. And and also because I like a challenge. <laughs> I like biting off more than I can chew. Um, <laughs> and you like living in a little a little shed in your garden. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, with a, with a family of five. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so, but I keep coming back to this idea of like, okay, well, if 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 we did, if we instead we did a, a shallow retrofit on this house, what would that look like? And I can't see how it would be very much less work. Like the floor, for example, the floor. So the floor was a suspended floor, no insulation at all. So just carpets on floorboards and then a ventilated space underneath it. No uh-huh. insulation, no draft proofing at all. And um, when we when we pressure tested the house, we depressurized it and the carpets all lifted <laughs> because you know air is seeping through each crack in the in the floorboards. Yeah. Um, and you know y- y- you always had cold feet because the floor was always cold yeah and what i did was i lifted all the floorboards up and then the joists are 180 mil and i extended them with plywood by another 100 mil and then i suspended a vapor permeable membrane um underneath like between the joist extensions that i'd made 
and filled that with loose fill wood fiber insulation and then mm-hmm. put an air tightness vapor barrier membrane on top of that. So I had 280 mil of insulation and that gives you like a U value of 0.15, which is what you need to get to NFIT if you're doing. So there's two ways of getting to NFIT. You can either hit the modeled heat demand of 25 um, kilowatt hours per year per meter uh-huh. squared, or um, if that's too difficult, well, or you can hit the the required performance for each of the things that you do. So the required U values for your floor and wall and roof, the required for performance for your windows, the required performance for your MVHR. Um, uh-huh. And because my because I'm adding insulation internally, I can't get to 25 kilowatt hours per meter squared because I can't add very much insulation. I can't get to super low U values for my walls. Yeah. But for my floor, I need to get to 0.15 to meet this component method. Um, so that's a really obvious point. Like if I was if I was going to go for a less if I was going to go for less than NFIT, the obvious thing to do in the floor would be not to extend the joists and just to insulate to 180 mil, and that would it would be quite a bit easier, I think. I mean, it's hard to tell because I haven't done it. I, all I've done is the the more difficult version, mm-hmm. um, but it would be a bit easier. But you're still lifting all your floorboards and moving all your kitchen. You've gone to all out. that trouble. And Might as well. yeah, it's it's not like, oh, that would be really easy. It's still like a massive job. Um, and like, you know, the, the kind of like, well, you could stick a little robot in underneath that would spray foam under your floorboards. Like my floor void was just full of so much crap that wouldn't have worked. It was like massive kind of 200 mil uh, warm air heating ducts from the 1970s. Right. Okay. That were that were you know blocking that were not used anymore i didn't know they were there until i took the floorboards up yeah um but you couldn't have insulated it with a robot spraying foam or you couldn't have insulated it well with a robot spraying foam yeah would you have wanted to do that no but i'm interested in it in in the sense of i'm interested in it because i'm interested in how you can drive retrofit at a mass scale because that's what we need to do yeah sure um i haven't looked into it in detail about the either the performance or the health impacts because i knew i didn't want to do it here i wanted to do it myself yeah 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 i'm not sure on what i'm not sure what the deal is with the health impacts of that stuff Mm -hmm. i'm not sure what the deal is in terms of the breathability like it's quite with a floor it's quite a lot riskier than the than the walls because because in a wall you've got a ventilated cavity that's vertical so the air can set up a convection current and that can drive quite a high air change rate yeah and in a floor you don't have that because it's horizontal um but you've got these timbers in your floor that are structural and you don't want them to get damp and i don't know how well that kind of stuff does with that but maybe mm. it's okay i haven't I haven't looked into it in detail and i don't know you know in terms of air tightness and stuff like that it's it's yeah so so it's really interesting but certainly for this type of house like on the walls, for example, I remember when I was speaking to a builder friend about what I was going to do to the walls, he was like, why don't you just put foam back plasterboard on with, I guess, without taking off the existing plasterboard, just, mm-hmm. you know, just put foam back plasterboard on. And the, you know, this, the stuff that's in my walls is disgusting and it would get worse with foam back plasterboard because you make everything colder. You haven't yeah. necessarily improved the air tightness very much. So you've still got warm, moist air leaking into your structure and, and back again, you know, like, I think there's a, there's a, you were talking about this with John about, um, like natural, the kind of appeal to nature, logical fallacy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I'm definitely susceptible to it. Like I like natural insulation cause it's nice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And cause I like the idea that we can grow stuff, um, rather than having to dig it up. But I think that one of the biggest coups for the crap building industry was calling crap ventilation, natural ventilation <laughs> <laughs> because, because, because people think, Oh, natural ventilation. That sounds nice. Yeah. I'm, I'm compiling a, a series of photos from my retrofit of like, if you think like leaky buildings is an appropriate way to ventilate your building, have a look at these photos. <laughs> just, just yeah, like where it was most leaky. That was also where it was most moldy because you know air leakage brings moisture in mm-hmm. where it was most leaky was also where it was most full of rodent feces and rodent skeletons because they they also can get in if air can get in or, mm-hmm. or you know if a rodent can get in then loads of air can get in um and you know 
we know that air was leaking in and out of those and that's where the air for the house was coming from you know doesn't it's it's pretty (laughs) minging really Um, (laughs) and uh, when when was your house built 1975 okay so it's quite early for um like most houses now built in scotland are timber frame Mm -hmm. uh, 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 that kind of timber frame with rendered block work like white rendered block work outside yeah um but then that it was quite new for then i think this this style of house um so it's it's really interesting like it's so moldy um well it's not it, it could be worse it's not I haven't had any timber that's so damp it's structurally a problem yeah right, okay i haven't got to any timber where i've been like oh i've got to replace that um i've got to timber that's wet to touch but it hasn't rotted yet okay um and i'm pretty you know i'm confident i can fix that but there's just a lot of black mold and white mold on that sheathing board Mm -hmm. it's quite often white mold and on the insulation it's quite often black Um, right and and that stuff's not good for you it would be it would be very interesting i think to take apart a house that was built more recently than two than this one because we're still very bad at doing air tightness Mm. generally as as an industry Unless, unless you're really into air tightness, exactly, yeah, you're poor yeah. about air tightness, yeah, 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 and and yet we're putting in much more insulation, and that combination is more risky. Like the more insulation you add, the colder your sheathing board gets, and so the more risk of high humidity and condensation there is there. Um, so it would be really interesting to pull apart a house that was built in like. 2005 and see how moldy it was but i suspect it'd be pretty moldy <laughs> <laughs> um, especially as like you know in this part of the world it's it's often raining when they're building the houses and they'll just like spray the sheathing board with bleach and then stick the insulation in so there's a load of built-in moisture from the start right um and yeah it's just it's just it's really shoddy yeah, I was reflecting about my house. Like, someone, someone said, "Oh, you do you wish you'd never started because it's so much work." Mm. And I just think, well, no. Like everything that I've done, everything, every time I've taken something apart, I've been like, "Wow, I'm glad I'm sorting this out." <laughs> yes, yeah. You know, you know what you're dealing with, and uh, yeah, and yeah. Know that you want want rid of it. Yeah, and you know, I kind of know as a passive house designer that building, building projects are often a bit shoddy but haven't once opened something up and thought oh they did a good job here <laughs> like that hasn't happened ever <laughs> like everything that you open up you're like wow they did this <laughs> really <Yeah. laughs> a couple of days ago i opened up the windows one one of the the, the window surround because i wanted to get um i'd 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 set about ordering windows ages mm-hmm. ago and i've done it estimating the, the sizes of the openings yeah. and then uh, the uh, ordering windows is complicated more complicated than i anticipated really yeah, is, i can see it? that you've had this experience <laughs> oh my goodness and so, so like you know the the list of questions was so long that by the time i'd answered them all i'd completely stripped nearly all the all the timber frame or all the surrounds so i could actually measure between the studs and, mm-hmm. and give the exact structural opening so I, did, I had one window left to do and I stripped that off and quite often in a timber frame house, they'll, they'll install the, the window frame um, in the ventilated cavity. Okay. So like in thermal performance terms, you should install it in line with the insulation because you don't want a thermal bridge there. Um, and, but quite often, I guess for weather really is that they'll, the outside of the, the outside of the window frame will be sitting flush with the, rendered block work Mm -hmm. and the inside of the timber of the window frame might reach the timber frame or it might not there'll there'll be a cavity closer in there Um, and there should be a cavity closer in there for fire safety so one of them that i opened up the cavity there was a cavity closer but there were like gaps in it that were big enough i could put my finger in and i was like that's a bit shoddy in terms of fire performance but the one i opened up the other day that they'd installed the window frame, the rear of the window frame was in line with the back of the block work. Okay. So it was complete. It was outside the, um, <laughs> the ventilated cavity. So your your the window is essentially outside the house all the time, yeah. and there was no uh, fireproofing of the ventilated cavity. 
So like, even if you don't care about thermal performance, it's like totally illegal in terms of um, mm -hmm. fire performance. And yeah, and it's, it, you know, the windows are UPV, UV, UPVC double glazing that don't look that old. I would be yeah. surprised if they're more than 10 years old. So it's not like something someone did 20 or 30 years ago when they didn't understand these things. So yeah, it's quite, it's quite an eye opener. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, what have you gone for for windows, by the way? Uh, I've gone for uh, Green Building Store Ultra on the ground floor. Nice. So we, we've got a funny situation where, like, the, what I've done so far has all been me doing it myself. And I can do, as as someone who's keen to learn <laughs> and watch lots of YouTube about how to do stuff, I can do all of the ground floor insulation. I can do the wall insulation. But what we're doing upstairs is really radical and not really related to thermal performance um okay so it's one of these houses where it's one and a half stories which means that the the eaves um at the front and the back of the house is at first floor level uh -huh. so internally you lose loads of space on the first floor um compared to the size of the footprint of the house there's like a big section of the room at the front and a big section of the room at the back that you can't use because mm -hmm. the, the ceiling level is too low so um we're actually taking the roof off and rebuilding the first floor walls to be um to be one and three quarter stories which means that the at the eaves the room height will be two meters internally and that gives us enough room to mine and my wife's bedroom will get bigger and it will get an ensuite shower and a little corner office mm -hmm. so the room itself will be bigger and there'll be two other little rooms the ba the main bathroom will get bigger my daughter's room will get bigger and my sons who currently share a room their room will get big enough that it can be split into two right that's substantial then yeah quite a lot of extra room and then the other thing is that we've got this amazing view to the south, which you saw earlier, yes. the view of Ben Nevis. Um, it's like south east. And we have n almost no view like directly to the west or the east, like from the gable of gables of the house. And the bedrooms at the moment, two bedrooms either side of the house, they have they only have windows in the gables. Okay. So like our bedroom window um looks at a tree that's three meters that's like four meters away and it's not a particularly <laughs> nice tree um and my boy's room looks directly at the neighbor's wall right um, and you know when there's this like world-class view oh crikey look at the cat you see that uh, oh crikey <laughs> she's good she's gone exploring she's not, i don't think she's been up there before <laughs> she can obviously smell rodent yeah um yeah, so for listeners, the cat just climbed up the timber frame wall and into kind of little void above um, a bay window. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, what was I saying? Um, the view, view from your boys. Yeah, room. so we've got this amazing view to the south, and two of the two of the three bedrooms have no view at all. So they're, they're rooms that you kind of tolerate for eight hours a day when you're asleep, but they're not nice rooms to be in. Yeah, at all. Um, and they will get a view of Ben Nevis, basically. So we'll get more space and those rooms will become nice to be in. That sounds um, like a good thing. But yeah, it's gonna it's gonna that's gonna be the thing that's really, really expensive. Um and so when we look at it at the end and we're like, how much was your benefit? Well, actually it was astronomically expensive, but the kind of actual benefit bit of it is not the expensive thing in this case. It's the fact that we're doing something absolutely crazy to go upstairs and I still can't decide whether it's the right thing to do, but <laughs> we're committed now. So, so I mean, really, it's a complete re-roof, is it? Complete re-roof and rebuild of the first floor, yeah. Mm. yeah. And and because of the vagaries of the site, it was difficult. We thought about extending instead because we needed more room and it, it didn't really work. Like this will end up with a much better building at the end of it. Yeah. And it's that kind of situation where you're like, well, you could sell the house and build somewhere else. But I, we really like exactly where it is, is, is an amazing place to live. It's, mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's got this fantastic view of the mountains and it's walking distance to primary school, walking distance to high school, cycling distance to Fort William um, yeah. next to a train station. You know, it's, it's, 
it's really really good and and most of the places that you can buy to build here you would end up ferrying children in a car most of the day all of the time <laughs> i'm quite keen to not spend the next 10 years driving kids back and forth to <laughs> yeah. Fort William. understandable yeah i mean it's going to be really interesting you're going to get the best of both worlds or experience of both worlds aren't you because you essentially have a new build top first floor yeah yeah yeah, where yeah. you can control all of the uh things and yeah you know. and and the construction there is going to be very different we're going to have eye joist walls um 300 mil of insulation and you know it's, it's essentially going to be a new build passive house from first floor up yeah it's interesting like i kind of look at what i'm doing on the ground floor as as a kind of test bed for being able to say to people this is what you could do to your house mm. and i think that's reasonably feasible like if they're willing to pay people to come in and do it it could be quite quick like it's taken me ages but i'm one person on my own and i'm having to learn how to do it because all yeah my all my knowledge is like computer based i don't mm-hmm. have i don't have any experience of building stuff so i've been really slow at it but um yeah i would be quicker second time around and um and and yeah you i could certainly help a build team be quite quick it's quite quite a lot of things where you kind of come across it and you're like oh crikey that's that's tricky how do you do that and thinking about like the level of knowledge you want your retrofitters to have mm-hmm quite eye-opening like just simple things like because i was adding 40 mil of insulation and then an insulated service cavity it meant that i couldn't just put my floorboards back to fix to the wall where they were where they were going to be before mm-hmm. because then they would have been in a zone that was very cold but they would be inside the vapor barrier and they would get damp and rot yeah and that's what would normally be done i think there's a lot of pitfalls that you need someone who understands those things, I think, looking at your project and, and thinking hard about it. There, there was there was the, the retrofit uh, push a few years ago in, in mm. I think it was probably just in England, but the, a lot of houses got insulation slapped on the outside. Yeah. Uh, done by largely people that didn't have a really good eye for, for these details or yeah. know kind of what could go wrong. And, you know, they've kind of ruined quite a few houses by creating yeah. more problems than they they solve yeah yeah it is it, it and it's the sort of thing like i discuss it a lot with people you know just parents you know watching the kids do sport or whatever talking to parents and they're like oh i'm insulating this this and this and it's it's a funny industry in that you can't really imagine you know as a surgeon if you were like a heart surgeon or something you wouldn't you wouldn't have a conversation and be like, oh, I'm thinking a bit about doing a bit of heart surgery. I might might do some heart <laughs> surgery tomorrow on my wife. Um, you know, like, but yeah. it's a but it's a similar like. Obviously, it's less serious, but it's similarly complicated. You know, and mm. and there's this there's this feeling that there's this idea that you can that anyone can do it. You just slap some insulation on, yeah, and it's quite hard to get to get across to people that it's not actually that simple and that they need to think really carefully about whether they need to either like learn a lot about it themselves or get someone who knows about it already um, yeah yeah i think it's 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 difficult to know how how to address how to how to approach that when you're talking to people who are doing it themselves and you suspect they're doing it not very well because mm. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it would be it would be very easy to come across as a bit of a prat Yes. If you're, if you're like telling, telling them they're doing it wrong. <laughs> well, I mean, as someone that's been told that I, I was telling people the wrong things by you. Uh, you <laughs> did you that did come it. across okay? Oh, yeah. I, it was, I have never felt so, so pleased to be corrected. Oh, good. Okay. That's good. <laughs> yeah. So, so you've obviously yeah. got a nice manner to, uh, to yeah. get in. I yeah. think you have, you have to do it in a way that doesn't, like, I mean, essentially, like I came from exactly the position you were you were in in yeah. terms of all the things that you said. I had I could remember saying to other people, mm-hmm. and so yeah, that's that's good. <laughs> like the fridge thing. Well, let's talk about the fridge thing. Oh yes, I yeah, just yeah. remembered about the fridge thing. So like I remember to I remember when I was working at the Earthship using the fridge thing as an example, and I think <laughs> it's completely wrong. Like I think so. The the full fridge thing 
I think it's because if you open the fridge door and your fridge is full of stuff, there isn't as much air to to, to leave and be yeah. replaced by warm air. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think it's to do with the, I don't think it's to do with thermal mass. Um, and you can imagine that like a fridge full of, let's say, say you had a fridge stacked full of milk um, and it might be oat milk if we're eco enough about it. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's say it's a fridge stacked full of oat milk compared to an empty fridge. You open the door, the empty fridge, there's loads more air change. So it needs to, so it's lost, it has lost more heat because more air change, more, more air has changed. Yeah. But if you left them both open for the, for the day, then all of the oat milk would cool to room, would warm to room temperature and it would have gained a lot more heat because there's, because of the thermal mass. Mm. Um, and then you close it and it would have to work harder to cool down again. Um, but it's, it's, yeah, it's right that a full fridge is better as long as you don't leave it open all day. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, you can't really apply the same to your house because if you filled your house with stuff so that when you opened the doors, there wasn't a high air change, a lot of air change rate, a, a lot of air to change because it was full of stuff, you'd end up living like one of those people who's got a chronic hoarding problem and has to be, has to like tunnel out of their house because they've stored every newspaper for the last 60 years. Yeah, uh, it's not um, to say that people don't do it, but it's not no. very practical. <laughs> exactly, <yeah. laughs> it certainly changes your way of life. There's that, there was a there was a case, wasn't there, where a guy, I think a guy died, and he he had to be, he his house was he'd collected newspapers for like decades, oh, yes, yeah, and yeah. and kept every single one, and and had like this series of very very ropey tunnels amongst his newspapers, and um yeah. <laughs> And no one talked about the energy efficiency of that building. No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I suspect he didn't need much heating because no, just had these tiny tunnels and and probably and quite a meters lot of rats. and meters of <laughs> meters. Yeah, lots of rats and meters and meters of cellulose insulation. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm curious about. I'm curious about your tiny house. I had a look on your blog. Oh yeah, and I couldn't find stuff about your tiny house. Am I looking in the wrong place? No, have you, I... written, have you written stuff about it? I haven't yet. Uh, okay, right, that's why. My blog is is years out of date, I think. Uh, yeah, so is mine. As blogs I think, tend to be. I think what what happens is is um you can you kind of have this thing where, or I had this thing where I was newly qualified as a pass fast designer. I just finished my PhD, but I didn't really have any work, mm. and so I lo- I, I did loads of reading, loads of courses, um, loads of writing on my blog, and then I got loads of work. <laughs> And I stopped doing any of those, doing those things as much. Yes. And I think there's a, I think I remember Nick Grant saying something about how being underemployed was actually very valuable because it allowed you to spend time learning stuff. And it's true. Yeah, like, learning and broadcasting. Yeah. Yeah. Like now I'm, I'm too busy and I've started my house retrofit and I'm doing a Twitter thread on it, but I haven't got any time to do a proper blog about what I'm doing because <laughs> I feel like, well, an hour or two spent doing that is, an hour or two not doing my house. Yeah, absolutely. I feel yeah. totally the same. I've got plans yeah. to kind of write everything up at the end. Whether yeah. or not, you know, I'll obviously move on to the next project and be. Yeah, full. yeah. But yeah, that would be the hope. <laughs> How close to finishing are you? I'm pretty close. Uh, okay. I, I have got, uh, well, here's my to-do list. And half of those, gas and water's already mostly there. The kitchen's mostly there. The electrics are mostly there, right? So, well, what, what, what gas? How how you have you got bottled gas? Bottled gas, yeah. For so for cooking uh, and for hot water at the moment. Again, right. you know, the dream is to go to electric, but mm. I am faced with the reality that I can't afford the solar system to. Uh, yeah, I mean, you're you're and you're off grid, so you'd have to have a big battery and a big solar system you? Mm. yeah and you're in some woods so presumably the solar resource is not that great or, or it's it not i mean i've got uh i've got free reign to uh cut a clearing so okay. it's right. it's all right and it is you know, it's relatively south facing on a slope so right um, yeah, yeah it's not the worst it could be and what have you done in terms of ventilation uh i have gone for two blauberg decentralized units okay is that um, a decentralized MVHR? Yes. And are they working? Are they are they installed? 
They are not. They are. Right. Uh, I've actually all I've got to do is put the wire in that one, and then it'll right. be working. Uh, and I will do that t- first thing tomorrow. Okay, quite, quite right. exciting. Cool. And the the MVHR units that you've gone for, I've not heard of them. Um, are they were they good? Do you think they they're, they're going to be good? We'll be back after a quick break. Hey there, I'm Mick from the Mick and Pat Show. That's right, and I'm Pat. Looking for a podcast that's like catching up with old friends? Well, you're in luck. We're here to bring you weekly doses of lifestyle commentary, discuss culture and politics, and top it off with the occasional beer and film reviews. But it's not just about us. We're a community. Our listeners are our kin, and we let you all have a say in what we discuss. So saddle up and join the conversation at The Mick and Pat Show. You can check out our website or find us wherever you get your podcasts. I really don't know. I spent so long fretting about the ventilation. Yeah. Uh, and I spoke to, uh, you know, ventilation consultants and they tried to push me into getting a, a ducted system, which right. would be ridiculous in this space. How big is the, how big is the house? Uh, two and a half meters by six and a half meters. So wh- why do you need two of them? Well, that was the one thing that my my consultant said was that they wanted that two for airflow. I mean, I'd That's happily I'd happily seal one of those holes up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I haven't looked at the numbers, but I would have I would have thought you could do it with a like a single. There's a Blue Martin. I think it's Blue Martin Free Air. Mm. So, oh yes, I looked a, at that one. A pass first certified one um, mm. that I think goes up to like seventy cubic meters per hour uh yeah per hour yeah um and usually for one person you'd want like 30 cubic meters per hour i think the concern was that it is one person but it's also a kitchen and a bathroom yeah uh yeah that's yeah so on something very small like that you end up sizing it on the number of wet rooms rather than Mm. on the number of people yes Um, so yeah yeah that might that might stack up so you've got a kitchen and a bathroom yeah, pretty much half of my floor space is kitchen and bathroom and right. then half living space with a little mezzanine mm. sleeping okay. loft. With, with good uh, fairy lights on it. Fairy lights and a round wood timber frame. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah. Um, so, yes, I mean, I'm intrigued about the whole MVHR uh, thing because just – I have I was – for a long time I was in the – the viewpoint that we should just make houses just a little bit leaky, Mm. you know, uh, and was sort of part of that kind of hippie building, you know, trained in on the West coast of Oregon, you know, I'm fully in that mindset of, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's taken me a little while to, to listen to people and understand. And yeah. 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 Did you speak to Judith Thornton about that when she was on the podcast? Yeah, well, she gave me a schooling on tape. Uh, right, on air tightness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and that so I, that changed changed. Yeah, good. Things pretty yeah, she's she's brilliant. Me. She was um, she was my kind of one of my favourite um, uh, lecturers at when I did the MSc at Cat. Oh, great! I thought she was very good. I, 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 I kind of arrived. I kind of arrived as like um, someone thinking Earthships were great and that um, recycling rainwater was a good idea and um harvesting rainwater was a good idea and i remember after the first week being like oh right yeah okay maybe not (laughs) she was quite convincing yes i like Um, she's very convincing and she's also just very direct yeah 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 (laughs) yeah 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 she's good um and i yeah i did a i did some i helped her with a blog post about air tightness and natural building materials okay um, that, that was I don't know if it was before or after you did that interview with her, but a similar thing, like the the, the fact that there is this, you know, people who like to build with natural materials tend, often tend to have that prejudice that natural natural ventilation is also better. Yes. And But because they're building with natural materials, they're building with biodegradable materials. And so actually they should be even more careful about, um, about moisture risk than... Yeah and air tightness than, than in a normal building. Um, and I think it's, it's really, I've had this conversation lots with people recently. Um, I've got a friend 
I, I, I can't persuade him that I'm right about air tightness. Um, and, and he's like an experienced builder. And it is, I kind of run up against this in my professional life all the time that, that people are like, well, what do you know? You're not a builder or what do you know? You're not an architect or what do you know? You're not an engineer. And the, yeah, that, that's a reasonable starting point. But like, I, I think that the, the confusion is that people confuse breathability and air tightness. Mm-hmm. And they think that a building, they think a building must be breathable, which it, isn't true and we can talk about that as well but but they think breathability is good and in some instances it definitely is and they think therefore air tightness is bad um, yes and the two things are, are different you can have a very airtight building that is also ve- that is also breathable because it's vapor permeable mm-hmm. um, and it's a similar thing to the mass thing the confusion about temperature and heat like they're they're related but they're not the same thing yeah, and breathability and air tightness, people conflate them. They think you know, breathability is like how easily can water vapor move through a structure, and air tightness is how easy can air move through a structure. Yeah, and in a timber frame, for example, you want you want breathability from the vapor barrier outwards. You want the vapor barrier to be not breathable at all, so that moisture doesn't get into the frame, and then from then on, you want it to get out as easily as possible. Mm-hmm. because you want to stop moisture getting in and any moisture that does get in you want it to get out but you can dump orders of magnitude more moisture into your into your build up by air leaking through it than you can by vapor moving through it through yeah. diffusion and it's really i find that re- really interesting like how do you communicate something that is so ingrained that is basically a a misunderstanding of language <laughs> um and i don't know i don't know what the answer is maybe you just need judith like standing up and saying <laughs> no you're wrong <laughs> and, yeah i um, mean i think the um yeah i mean the term breathability is is just confusing isn't it because yeah. we think of breathing as breathing air not yeah. moisture um, yeah yeah so that that's a bad term and i also think air tightness is a it doesn't sound like a good thing yeah, 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 yeah. It immediately uh, makes you think I'm going to suffocate if we exactly. get that, if we get lots of that. Yeah, yeah. I think that's I, I've not thought of that before, but that's a good point. That so they're two two bad words for for yeah the yeah, function we need we're a trying, new word trying to get for, for air tightness that makes it sound better. <laughs> yeah, and we need a new word for natural ventilation that makes it sound worse. Bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, was it who was it was it Kate the selling court I think called it uncontrolled leaky ventilation or something okay that, that wasn't it wasn't catchy but kind of summed up what it was um, <laughs> intello the intello membrane mm. are you saying that doesn't let vapor through yes so anything like so, so vapor permeability is um the, something like a membrane is always got some degree of vapor permeability it's, right. it's it's very hard to have something that's completely vapor impermeable and mm. the things that are completely vapor impermeable are things like aluminium okay um which is why they make crisp packets out of you know they have an aluminium coating on them um so um a standard vapor barrier membrane like a sort of plastic sheet type or an internal something sheet. tougher like i've got proclima da in my floor yeah and that's that's it's it's airtight and it's a vapor barrier and it's not variable so it's always a vapor barrier so there will still be some vapor diffusion through it but but very little and um intello is what's called a variable vapor barrier and so at typical humidities in a room of like 40 to 60 percent it's a vapor barrier Mm -hmm. and when the humidity goes very high i can't remember what the threshold is i mean it's not a hard threshold but it's maybe over 70 or over 80 or something when the vape when the relative humidity goes high it becomes vapor open right okay and so the way it works is that you've you've got um you've typically got like your humidity if you've got good ventilation is um is between 40 and 60 let's say Mm. and so it's it's acting as a vapor barrier in that in that case and then in the summer if you've got sun shining on your wall that can drive a wave of water vapor from the outside to the inside and um and so you can get very high relative humidities 
just on the insulation side of the of the vapor barrier. Right. And so in Tello, because it's high humidity there, it's, so let's say it's eighty percent. In Tello, will then allow that it will become vapor open and it allow it will allow it through to dry right. into the room. Right. Um, so that's uh, that's that's how that works. And I think it's just a a, str- a, a material property. I don't of the of the type of plastic that you use, mm. and that it becomes that the the vapor the, the vapor permeability changes with with the humidity. Um, there's another one that um, Seeger, I think, do one that's that's directional. Mm-hmm. So it's a vapor barrier in one direction, and it's a it's vapor relatively vapor closed in one direction and it's relatively vapor open in the other direction i don't understand how that works but um, you can see why why they do it mm. um, yeah and the, the place that that becomes really important is kind of flat roofs because it's difficult to do well in terms of having a ventilated space above the insulation so typically you've got like a vapor impermeable epdm yeah. on top of the insulation and so normally you know like in a wall you're you're wall or your roof in a pitch roof it can dry out to the outside um that can't happen but because it's a, a roof it can get lots of solar energy and that can dry it out to the inside um god oh, blimey it's far more clever than i, <laughs> than I thought <laughs> yeah, i mean I, of- i've just come from a yeah you know, a world of i want to clay plaster the inside and i want to lime render the outside <laughs> uh, and goodness yeah that's a, a simpler thing although you know there's there's all complexities in there as well so yeah yeah it's it's there's a lot there's a lot to learn isn't it? And, and there's you know there's stuff to learn all the time i think like i'm i'm le- learning all the time which is good mm. but it makes you feel that maybe <laughs> when when do you ever learn, when do you ever know enough I <laughs> and, yes yeah. yeah very true i i'm, I'm actually not working uh, so i was I think my Twitter bio hasn't been updated, but I, I'm not really doing my own consultancy now. I'm working for uh, John Gilbert Architects in Glasgow. Okay. And um, well, I'm not working in Glasgow, but they're in Glasgow, and I'm working from home. And I'm doing quite a lot of really interesting non-domestic projects, and those are like, you know, just another level in terms of what you need to know. Suddenly, like, I'm doing a, I'm doing a leisure centre with a swimming pool. Okay. That's to passive house standard. Right. That's a lot of moisture to deal with. Yeah, exactly. There's a lot to know here. <laughs> Suddenly you have to become like nearly an expert in pool ventilation and pool water treatment and, um, you know, uh, like filtration of swimming pool water and all that sort of thing. It's, it's fascinating, but it's like totally head expanding. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Like it, it's really interesting, like how, there's a kind of cascading series of of benefits to doing the passive house thing on a swimming pool, which which is fascinating. Like basically, because you have a super insulated external shell and the windows are triple glazed and with insulated frames, you don't have cold surfaces for the for condensation to happen on. Uh-huh. And so that means that you can tolerate a higher humidity in the pool hole without structural risk to the building. Okay. And that means that you can, that reduces evaporation from the pool, which means that you have less water to heat because you're not losing water. Yeah. And it means that you're, the evaporation itself takes heat. So you're, you've got lower heat losses from your pool. And because you don't have to keep your humidity lower, your ventilation rate can drop. Mm. So there's like these series of interlinked things that all, cascade towards it being a much lower energy solution wow um which is really interesting but it's also like like if you you, you get this quite a lot as fast fast designer you're you're saying right we're going to design a building that uses 80 percent less energy and so like the logical conclusion is you're going to have to do things differently from what you normally do and that's the same for a swimming pool like this thing's going to use 80 to 90 percent less heating than a normal swimming pool Mm. So obviously we're going to do things a little differently from normal and you know, normally the ventilation system or often not always, but they blow warm air over the windows to stop condensation. Uh-huh. And um, so we don't do that anymore. And normally they supply air at pool level 
and they extract it from high level. And that works in terms of buoyancy because the warm air rises. So your ventilation system doesn't have to work as hard. Mm -hmm. But in terms of humidity, it means that you're you're blowing the driest air over the pool right. itself and increasing evaporation from the pool. And then when the water the air is picked up the moisture, it's then going over the fabric. And so in, in a passive house pool, you do it the other way. You you extract a pool at low level and you supply it at high level. Mm-hmm. And that means that the highest humidity is directly above the water, which decreases the evaporation um, and improves comfort in the swimming pool. Because like if you're standing in the swimming pool playing with your kid and mm. your shoulders are out, then the humidity that's surrounding your shoulders and head impacts how fast you lose heat from evaporation. Yeah. So if you're in a humid environment there, that's better um, for your comfort. But the people watching who are in their clothes want to be in a drier environment. They don't want to be in the humid environment because they get too hot. Mm. Um, and so you want the you want the highest humidity over the pool and you want it lower elsewhere. Um, so it's it's really interesting, but just like so 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 big, like so many <laughs> things that you have to keep an eye on and are there are there think, other think examples about. that or are you leading the way in this? Oh, in terms of swimming pools. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So, um, no, there's just about to be one certified in Exeter. Oh, yes, I did. I saw that. Yeah, that I'm not involved in. We we went down to see it um, when it was it just, they were kind of half out of the ground. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was really interesting. And I hope we'll go down and see it again, actually, and have a swim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, that, and then there's two in Germany. So two pass fast certified swimming pools in Germany and, and one about to be certified, certified here. So I don't know if there are any other projects underway. I think it, if ours, when ours gets built, I think it will be the second in the UK. I don't mm-hmm. think there are any others in the pipeline, but there might be. Um, so yeah, I mean, really interesting. And, you know, you can imagine a swimming pool is like a big user of energy. So the, mm. the, 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 the potential gains are, are really huge. And do you, and you reckon a 90% reduction though? Yeah, I'd, I'd say 80%, maybe, maybe not 90 mm-hmm. um, in, in heating demand. Um, so other energy might not go down as much as that, but the heating demand is the big thing for a swimming pool. Um, yeah. Well, no, that's not true. Heating demand, but also like pumping water around. It's also high energy demand. So I've had to learn a lot about like how you minimize the, de- the energy demand of pumping water around um, that you don't think about at all in, buildings in, in domestic buildings because yeah, you're not really course. doing it very much um so yeah really really interesting a long way from earth ships <laughs> <laughs> how far you've come <laughs> yeah <laughs> we, should an, we should do an earth ship swimming pool <laughs> What a splendid chap and what a splendid chat. I'm wishing him all the best with his build. Uh, The progress he posts on Twitter is uh, inspiring and really beautiful to see such a good job being done. Uh, There was lots and lots of discussion around Ez's last episode, both in the Building Sustainability Community Facebook group and also on Twitter. There are links to both of those in the show notes. So do get involved and ask questions. Ez is in the Facebook group and very active on Twitter, so you'll get an answer to your questions. So if you've enjoyed this episode, please do give it a quick share. It really does wonders for the podcast reach, and I see big jumps in listenership whenever you do so. So it's really appreciated. Um, And you know what? It'd be good to spread a bit of positivity and a bit of forward focus, doing the right things, doing them well. Uh, I feel like at the moment it's it's hard. It's hard to stay positive at the moment. The IPCC report, which states very clearly that we need to act now and we need to act hard to avoid catastrophic consequences, has been totally ignored by those in power for what I can only see as reasons of greed. It's utterly crushing to me. It doesn't fill me with any hope and maybe it's just because i am at the end of a very long and tiring build project maybe i haven't got the energy to uh, to stay positive at the moment but 
I would say that running away and living in the woods and putting my head firmly in the sand has never felt so appealing. So, hmm, that's a bit of a downer to end on. Uh, I hope you're well and I hope that you're doing loads of really great things and spreading positivity uh, in whatever you're doing. Um, all the best and until next time. Bye-bye.